Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is Taking Care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to have Danika Kelly with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with Luden Osman. Somali-born poet and essayist Luden Osman is the author of Exiles of Eden, a work of poetry, photos, and experimental text, and The Kitchen Dweller's Testimony, winner of the Sillerman First Book Prize, and the chapbook Ordinary Heaven. Danika Kelly is the author of The Renunciations and Bestiary recipient of the Kave Kanem Poetry Prize, Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry, and Kate Tufts Discovery Award. A Kave Kanem Fellow and member of the collective Poets at the End of the World, Kelly has received a Lannan Residency Fellowship and a Summer Workshop Fellowship from the Fine Arts Works Center. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic Online, The Paris Review, and Foglifter. She lives in Iowa City and is an assistant professor at the University of Iowa, where she teaches creative writing. Oprah.com has called the renunciations a lion-hearted odyssey through the self, a casting aside of old mythologies and traumas in search of new stories fashioned from love and joy. Like some sort of oracle, Kelly offers us words to create our own destinies. Danika, thank you so much for being here. Dan, it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here uh, and to get to be in conversation with my dear friend Levin. Um, I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's a, it's a, I think the heat is breaking here in Iowa. So uh, I'm going to go ahead uh, and get started. I'm going to read from the Renunciations. And uh, I often think there are two well, I think there are two tracks through the book and one of them is a little sad and the other one is very sad. Um, and since it seems not to be, you know, uh, a bad day, I think I'll just go with the, with the track that's a little sad. Um, and so, yeah, so I'll, I'll, sorry, let me start my timer. I certainly don't like to go long. Okay. All right. Uh, so the first poem that I'm going to read is titled Deer, um, and it's a D-E-A-R, uh, and then an M dash, uh, trying to evoke some of those uh, 19th century, no, not really, um, but this is, a, this is an epistolary poem, and there's a sequence of them throughout the book. So, Deer. We come from abundance, each season bowed with rain. But here is the earth, eager to flame, the air like salt, thirsty even for the water we carry in our skin. New wanderers in this land, we do not know how to wait for water, have never waited so long for rain that every tree died, left to stand tender. For now, I watch the shoulder burn, drag through the smoke that blots the mountains and holds the old yoke of sun. I know nothing of fire its reach, its spread, know only that everybody manages its own ash, that everybody makes its own ash, manages its own diminishing. Uh, <laughs> bedtime story for the bruised hearted. The trees were all women once, fleeing a god wedded with lust until their fathers changed them, bound their bodies in bark, and still the god took a branch to crown his own head, the reeds to hold his breath. How like them, our fathers, those small gods who unearthed their children with rage, who scored the bark and bent the branch to bind their bodies with our own. Tonight, my love, we are free of men, of gods, 
And I am a river against you, drawn to current and eddy, ready to make, to be unmade. Uh, I remember reading, this was a couple of years ago, I was reading a bunch of, uh, well, I was reading uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis and I was really struck by the turning the nymphs into trees as a strategy of escape. <laughs> I was like, this feels like a lot. Um, and so the, the next poem uh, is one of the first ones uh, that I would say sort of deals with hiking. It's just like, a, it, there are a lot of poems that sort of take place in national parks, state parks, national monuments um, that I'm gonna read, a few of which I'm gonna read tonight. And uh, there's probably more to say about hiking, but I won't say it right now. Um, so this is titled, uh, Ars Empathica, Muir Woods National Monument. We lived in the imperative, walk through the tree, spin in the light, take dominion over one another. But about the tree, no euphemism there. A tree fell, a man with metal teeth ate the bark, the heartwood, the bark. We were like that then, eaten and eating, sawing and sawing. I mean, of course, our bodies, but also how we mounted together the hill. Be dizzy, said the sun. Be dizzy, said the blood. Be dizzy, said the heart and lungs and vessels between. How I cried at the summit. You block the sun and somewhere the ocean. What sweet anchor your eyes made. Uh, okay, so this one is titled uh, Love Poem. Let us be ocean and coast, a taking into and over one another, shifting sediment, a breaking down of rock, dredge, and deposit, a series of prepositions meaning proximity, although the most of us extends away from one another. Once in winter, I ventured far inland, Forgot the crash of gravity pulling you over me and away. Forgot there is a place where we meet and retreat, but never let go. Let this be a moment of remembering my love as I stand at the edge of myself, cliff and sea grass and the screaming gull above, sighting your breath to the horizon. So the next poem I'm going to read uh, is titled In the Chapel of St. Mary's. And I don't know if folks here have had the experience of uh, in the process of writing, through the process of writing, coming to a realization about themselves that maybe they hadn't known before. And I definitely had that experience while writing uh, this poem. Uh, I felt like I, I figured out something that would be important for like the trajectory of my life like thereafter. So um, like no pressure on this poem to do anything <laughs> but be a poem, but there was that moment uh, for me uh, as the person writing it. So this is titled, In the Chapel of St. Mary's. I can't tell you what happened there, why I entered the sanctuary a non-believer, only that I've been thinking about worship, the altar of the body and supplication for some time. My thoughts turn as they often do in this season of absence to my wife and how tired a God can get when called and too often for little reason but loneliness. Of course, I don't mean God here, but rather the woman I love who alters the orbit of my life, pulls me with the density of light toward her, the draw thinner when she is farther away as she is now. I try to find comfort in the inevitability of science when what I lack is faith, the sanctuary the stained glass, four girls saturating it with soft chatter, small pots of stargazer lilies, a lace ribbon for each pew. This place is full of faith in the unknown and I don't know how to believe in what I cannot see. Tonight, I will drive through the foothills and into the valley. I will try to make a little practice to trust you are with me, even though you're somewhere else. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's good to try to make a practice, even if it's just practice uh, and it doesn't necessarily uh, lead to anything beyond that. So uh, this next poem is titled, Dear. Uh, oh, and a thing to know about this poem, uh, I'm gonna pause, there's like some bracketed like white space and so towards the end and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause 
uh, to, to hold that space. So I will not, it's not that I'm frozen when I get to that. Uh, so, dear, I am neither land nor timber, neither are you ocean nor celestial body. Rather, we are the small animals we've always been. Land and sea know each other at the threshold where they meet as we know something of one another, having shown at different times some bit of flesh, some feeling. We call the showing knowing instead of practice. We said at different times a feeling comes. What is the metaphor for two animals sharing the same space? Marriage? We shared a practice, a series of postures. See how I become a tree. And you? A body in space. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this next poem takes place in a skating rink in Nashville. Uh, the man, the man in this poem, I just like I. Sometimes it feels important to say. Sometimes it, it doesn't. The man in the skating rink that inspired the poem, he was very beautiful, and I was very sad. And it was nice to encounter. <laughs> uh, it was perfect to encounter. Uh, that amount of beauty when I was sad. Like for whatever reason, it just sort of brought me up a little bit. So this is titled Citing Virtue, Rivergate Skate Center, Nashville, Tennessee. The man in orbit blooms a heart on his back. The heart blooms wings of water and in me rises not mercy, but a sense of order. I've drifted, loosed from the one who bound me, a planet with no anchoring star, and I know this man is neither God nor sidereal body, but neither is he a woman with an alchemical heart. His skin, his beard, his full breast enrapture me, draw my gaze from every other whirling body. I've drifted. And I know the man in orbit is not a man in orbit, but one in revolution, where revolution means change or a way of moving, where muscle ripples to water, moves from a state of gold to one of lead. Him. Dear river, dear creek, dear damned tributaries, dear fuse, dear dynamite and wet match, amen. The water don't love me and she don't love me and maybe I'm drowning from the inside. Who put the river in my arm said, don't let the water. Maybe the knife got a hard kiss and a sweet bite. Maybe the knife only metal and wood and a bit of brass, but maybe it know how to love the inside of me. Maybe I don't believe in meaning and God and plans and paths. And the closer I am to my animal self, the more human I am, the more I let myself break like a wave, ocean in my arm, stone in my arm, iron and wood and brass in my arm. I like to think of that poem as like the bottom. <laughs> uh, and uh, this next poem uh, is sort of the, the climb out of the bottom. Uh, citing Tarot, Pflugerville, Texas. I learned how to hug here, how to draw a boundary and hold here against the gale force of my mother's late night rage and sob, learned too what it meant to be chosen, to choose, brought myself back to the receiving line, my chest cracked into two wet pieces after a fall so lonesome I wasn't sure I'd survive and met the arms practiced in mending. I ask Jenny to read my cards. Sid and Shannon on the couch behind me, Amber and Joe in the kitchen, Nat in from Berkeley, the kids running around, Carlisha, I'm sure, at my right hand. Jenny spread the Celtic cross, gestured grandly as she does, which gestured as she does, which is to say grandly at my present, at the problem we all knew, the past, the conscious and unconscious, waited for the cards to name what we could all see there at the position of hopes and fears. Three swords and one heart. How rude, I thought. Do y'all see this shit? I said aloud, the room gone quiet. A relief not to have to say what I had known in the room where I'd learned the kind of love possible between friends, now family, the kindness possible between partners, grateful for the rough blow finally landed and the net to catch me. Dear, 
question. How do we process being overcome when we know the water is rising, rising because the sea ice is melting, melting because the animal we are shortens everything we touch into brief, useful pieces? Question. Can we call our marriage done, soon overcome, soon underwater, a city inhabited by whatever the sea brings to it? Question. How do you drown a city? Throw into the ocean every suffocation, the folded clothes, the lemon tree, a wife, anything that will sink as a stone. Dear one, it is too soon. Is it too soon to call? I cannot swim and I will not drown. And I was just telling Dan um, <laughs> that uh, I lived in Western New York for a couple of years. Uh, and it was actually the first place where I encountered snow, um, like real snow, like not ice, which is mostly what Arkansas has. Um, and be, I had been in California, I've been back in California for just one year, but I think it had just sort of like primed me to be like anxious about smoke and ash. Um, that was yet another year when the wildfires were, were really strong. Um, and so I get to Western New York, which is a completely different climate, uh, obviously not dry in the same ways. And every time it snowed, like at the beginning, <laughs> so like October, every time it snowed in October, like whenever it would start, I would be like, is something on fire? Is this ash? It just like didn't make sense to me. Um, I don't know. Dear. <laughs> I take the first snowfall for ash. Mistake, I mean the first flake that comes wisping down for the remnant of something burned, perhaps for warmth or an error. When we were young, we stood with our backs not to the past or future, but toward the hot desperation of being alive and for right now. At the canyon's edge, the wind thick as a hand, ready to push you into gorge and river rock. Come back, I said, and the wind took my voice too. Love, there is no fire here. Only water, finally, drifting to coat the grass, to keep it green, to heap the limbs and needles in wet, heavy white. Uh, this next poem, the first part of this next poem, so the thing about Western New York, the town I lived in, it was founded in 1854, which I did not know until I had the dream that I write about in this poem about the town being haunted. And for whatever reason, I was like, oh, this confirms that the town is in fact haunted um, because I had this like information that I didn't know that I had. Um, I wasn't born haunted. Uh, one visitation. The double spouted horse haired wedding vase given to us by your aunt and uncle, the one you packed with my things carefully wrapped and exiled as I was exiled, fell twice from the closet shelf before it broke. That was the summer I dreamed of a girl in white who told me she had haunted this town since 1854. The town was founded on oil and timber, a promised canal from lake to river, but I felt the blood in it. All through the fall, the months I waited for winter, then the months of winter, I lived with the violence of all that had been taken here, such that come summer, whatever rattled the living room walls, I turned my back, thought, if it needs me, it will call my name. Two. I'm sorry, the girl said from inside the closet. Everything dead was once living. I remember how like the land we became, the groundwater pumped dry, a settling into subsidence. We almost survived the drought we'd wandered into, but found the water too late, the dust too thick. I don't believe in ghosts. That doesn't mean they aren't real, which doesn't mean they aren't real. The second fall, despite your careful wrapping, broke one of the spouts clean off. I figured this was one way of calling my name, of saying enough. So I'm just gonna read two more poems uh, and then I'm excited to, to talk to, to Lovin. Uh, okay, um, a dead thing that in dying feeds the living. I've been thinking about the anatomy of the egg, about the two interior membranes, the yolk held in place by the calaisi, gases moving through the semi-permeable shell. A curious phrase, the anatomy of the egg, as if an egg were a body, which it is, as if the egg could be broken, then mended, which depending on your faith, broken, yes, but mended, well, 
Best to start again with a new body, voided from a warmer one, brooded and turned. Better to begin as if some small-handed animal hadn't knocked you against a rock, licked clean the rich yolk, and left the albumin to dry in the sun, as if a hinged jaw hadn't swallowed you whole. What I wanted. A practice that reassured that what was cracked could be mended or at least suspended so that it could not spread. But now I wonder. Better to be the egg or scaled mandible. The small hand or the flies, bottle black and green, spilling their bile onto whatever's left, sweeping the interior, drinking it clean. I think something might have grown there, though I, I know it was never meant to be eaten. It was always meant to spoil. The moon rose over the bay. I had a lot of feelings. <laughs> the home I've been making inside myself started with a raising, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested, a cycle fallow, said winter, said the ground is too cold to break pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watched it ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new groundwater, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it a pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it a song. Everything rushed past my small ears, were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood, about time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. Thank you so much for listening. I feel like I should just jump in. Thank you so much for that reading, Danica. Thank you, Lada. That's so beautiful. Um, so, well, I feel like I should just start with a few thoughts. Um, uh, I'll just read this because I'll get nervous otherwise. <laughs> um, I love this book and how you hold your poems, how they move in the air as you read them. You establish climates, internal places as landscapes where knowing and dreaming can interact, where gods can be observed in their fuller forms. This book is a monument to the self in monumental pain, but it's also a reminder that we have the ability to curate our vision of ourselves, our histories, and the landscapes we treasure that there's freedom in renouncing and rejecting one thing and pulling close another thing. You're a maker in the most provocative and experimental sense. And I'm so glad to see your, your powers expressed so freely in this fantastic book. Thank you, Levin. You're so kind. Um, yeah, this is also, very true. <laughs> I feel like our books have so much in common, you know? Like, I feel like there's, there's something like that sort of core thing that we're wrestling with you know, like about just sort of like, I mean, I don't know if this is how you understand what's going on in your book, but I do feel like there's a way that, you know, that speaker is trying to get closer or those speakers are trying to get closer to like themselves and like to the center mm -hmm. of their own lives. Um, and I think like your book is also like rich with so many landscapes and there's just like, I don't know. I, I, Yes. Um, <laughs> we're supposed to be talking about you, Danica. I'm just saying, I just think, I mean, like that was, that was the reason I wanted to talk with you is that um, aside from being buds, I do feel like our work is, is mm -hmm. in conversation and that we're both engaged in practices that sort of resonate with each other. Yeah. I mean, I'm really glad that you see that in my work because that's something that I immediately um, admired about your work is that, um, it's a new way. It's like something, it's not exactly that the book or the poem has to make an argument, even though it absolutely does and makes a successful one, but that uh, it's just a different way of imagining and of dealing with information that it's, it, to me, it's more like, so that I love when you bring in science because so much of your work is like, like you need like quantum physics to understand some of the emotional registers is that time time is not linear and we're not going to look at this in a linear way and what heritage and heirloom means in your work is not um the standard thing even though you absolutely have like a lineage and you know different kinds of even literary histories that you're writing into so mm -hmm. um but i'll just go right into different questions um i'm not sure how much space we're leaving for the audience but i'll keep an eye out on the q a okay so I'm thinking about your quote in May Day. I was just reading all your interviews and I've been slow until now, but I'm really glad that I just kind of got to jump into all of them. 
Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of um, conversations um, about trauma and asking you how you cope as well, um, which if you wanted to say anything about that, I think that's, I'm sure you expected it, but it's, it's interesting to encounter so often, um, you know. Um, but you say sometimes those traumatic memories can really feel like falling back in time, but this speaker is present and is an adult and is safe. I'm also thinking about how you said in uh, the Pen 10 interview that you like to reread or revisit novels. So I'm wondering if you were considering overriding memories um, and is this a part of recentering yourself or even reprogramming how you name things? And I mean this question, not only as um, your speaker, but you know, you as a writer and the project of the book and what you're trying to do with information and with trauma. Mm -hmm. uh I think that's a great question. Uh, and maybe the way that I'll sort of come at it is that I think for some folks encountering the book, it may seem as if uh, this is a recounting of traumas in some ways. Uh, and But the way that I've come to understand the project of the book, and this has to do actually with the title as well, is that um, there's a story that I was telling myself about my experiences. And that story um, kept me enthralled to a bunch of bad ideas about how to relate to people and what I was worth. Um, and in doing the work of writing these poems and like the attendant many hours of therapy that <laughs> went along with that, uh, I would say that the I've, I've really have come to understand the poems as as a as a presentation of like here's the memory but the the work of the poem is not presenting the memory the work of the poem is interrogating the story about the memory mm -hmm. right it's like why why does this have the hold on me do i want it to have the hold on me that it that it has am i ready to do something different um is there another way to understand what's happening here and i i didn't expect that to come of the work um, because it doesn't change what happened, but it changes um, like my relationship to myself, right? And so, and and I and I and I imagine, I hope that that is also true for the speaker, that in constructing a world where one is not where like where the speaker is not lost in the memory, but is in fact sort of observing the memory taking the scope of the memory, sort of thinking about how that memory sits inside of the speaker's life, that there's a way that there's, that it models perhaps a way out, right? Or a way around or through something um, in terms of how one, how like that speaker is relating to it, because I know that it's changed the way that I've related to a lot of those memories. Does that make sense, Lava? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I think, I mean, it's complex. <laughs> um, I think that there's a, a whole like uh, craft book in there about how to approach that. But I'll ask you a specific question because I'm personally very curious about this. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of weight and caring in your poems, in these poems, but also new definitions of relief or I, maybe not even definitions, but experiences or glimpses at what relief can look like. Sometimes the speaker is still very deep in those memories or those moments that look like helplessness, but like I don't feel helpless reading them or even revisiting my own trauma as I read. And so you also said that the speaker withholds information at times. And so I wondered how do you understand sharing and bearing weight yeah. and proportion? Um, and I'm looking more carefully at your Dear series and your graphic choices there. You spoke um, in one interview about um, a collaboration with an artist um, that you went to like a school with. Sorry, I don't remember yeah, the name Susanna, of that. Um, Susanna Kwan. Susanna. Yeah, Susanna yeah. Kwan. Yeah. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm curious about how you're looking at that and specifically in some of those physical choices in that really stunning series. Um, and if you wanted to talk a bit about um, margins too, or how you revise those poems. I'm mm -hmm. super curious about it. Yeah. Um, so the thing that I'll say uh, about this, I'll maybe start in the place of like tenderness. It took me a long mm -hmm. time to develop tenderness towards myself. 
and especially like towards my younger selves, like it took kind of a long time. I think I was like into my late twenties before I was like, oh wait, a child, like how would I treat a child? (laughs) And I was like, oh, I would treat a child kindly because children are little. Um, But it took a long time to get to that space. And um, and I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to work with the therapist I work with um, to to get there. Um, And I had had some experience like practicing tenderness with my friends, which had been really wonderful because like my childhood had not been one where tenderness was like the the forward feeling uh, and the forward practice. Uh, so I was really grateful to have friends with whom I could be tender and who treated me tenderly. It was, it, that was such a gift. And so I got to learn how to do that. And then I figure out how to, you know, extend that tenderness towards myself. Um, and so I had like that under my belt when I started writing the poems for that would end up in this book. Cause I've been writing around, uh, the topic of childhood sexual abuse for like, as long as I've been writing, but that that piece was missing, that sort of tenderness was missing, that kindness was missing. And uh, when I got into the space of kindness and tenderness, um, I think my instincts and intuitions uh, very much shaped my approach to sharing information. And some of it was not wanting to have to write things that were hard. You know, I was just like, what if I don't write it? <laughs> I was like, actually, that will be fine. Yeah. And what, and the way that that ended up feeling for me, like in terms of the speaker that I was like sort of constructing over the, the, the arc of the, of that sequence of that particular sequence, um, was that it began to feel like a kindness to her, that there were things that she might remember, but didn't have to say, because saying it does is like a different level, you know, and then mm-hmm. So that, that level of withholding was for me, like it was a way of extending kindness to myself. And then I think kindness to Mm -hmm. my speaker and then kindness to the reader, I think, I hope. Um, But that was intuitive. And that was different from like the redactions uh, that I think you're talking about with the dear poems. And so I'll show like, so these were like real letters that I, I talk about therapy all the time, but I don't, have you had that thing in therapy where they're like, write a letter to somebody, um, but don't send the letter. That's like my like failure point in therapy because it (laughs) it got to a point where I was like, now you have to talk about the things in the letter with the people involved if you want or I'm like, yeah, that I'm good on that. I just need to take a break. I was like, I remember for the long, I was like, I'm not writing a letter. You can't tell me to write. You can't make me write a letter. Um, Because that actually, again, like writing it down felt like so much, like it felt like a, like a bigger kind of, of, uh, there was something about writing it that made whatever the feelings were weightier. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I was really resistant to that practice, but um, I, once I did it, (laughs) I was like, well, I have these letters. I'm not going to send them. So mm-hmm. what do I do? Um, and I wasn't going to do anything with them. I just, I really hadn't just written them like years before um, and was, you know, I don't know, just, I was revisiting those feelings later. And I was in a workshop and the workshop leader, Gabby Cavill Caressi was like, why don't we try like some uh, redactions or like, you know, get the marker and black things out and like try to find a poem and something else you've written and another poem you've written. And I was like, oh, I got these letters. (laughs) Let me, (laughs) let me see if there's something in here. And I started doing that. And I was like, oh, this feels both very satisfying and signals a kind of withholding that is, Mm -hmm. that, is about privacy, <laughs> right? So that is like a kind of protective um, withholding that's like, and that feels a little bit different um, than mm-hmm. the other, than the sort of brackets uh, and the white space. It feels like a, like saying to the reader, there are things that you don't have access to, yeah. right? And I think with the kinds of poems, with the, with, the, with the types of poems that are in this book, it can feel like the reader has access to a lot um, but it's just like a very small part, you know, and mm-hmm. it's a very small shaped part. Um, yeah. yeah, there's something safe about those limitations. And you do mention, um, I think there's possibly more than one place about like just the 
the power of, of stopping that the reminding yourself that you could stop at any time and that you're mm-hmm. not presently in any danger. And that's mm-hmm. also, you know, a good reminder because, you know, sometimes, you know, you know, that too, that your poems can be like documentaries and, you know, there's something about like being in someone's business, but then I love the there's also, <laughs> yeah, but then they're also, you know, <laughs> director of a documentary is going to curate for you how mm-hmm. you, enter this information and the transitions and things like that mm-hmm. um well I think I'll just skip ahead to this because um we've had you know private conversations or just even brief exchanges about punctuation I think um maybe you're re- revisiting some of the poems in your book I, I don't know if it was a revision question for you or just a craft like inquiry that you were having with yourself but did you want to to share any of your thoughts or ideas any discoveries that you had about Um, breath and especially how that's expressed in punctuation or um, you know with some of these striking graphic choices or even repetitions how you uh, label movements um, in the book which you know are not numerical but give a sense of time so Mm -hmm. anyway I feel like my questions are too layered but Thankfully, you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. And also, uh, your questions are not weird. What I think is funny is that when we talked about punctuation, you were the one giving the craft class. So oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Um, I was like, let me write all of this down so I can take it to my students. Because um, I think what you and I were talking about with punctuation is, uh, and the way that I've, I've been thinking about punctuation the last few years, is that it really is a way of, indicating connection um and like indicating like a level of connection and the i've been trying to get my students to to explore punctuation a little bit more they're really resistant they're like no punctuation or very standard punctuation and i'm like okay like is there any flexibility here um and i think part of what had happened is i have been reading bridget pekin kelly who uses a ton of colons Mm-hmm. And I can't remember what book it was, but there was just like, there was, it was like, it was like an unnesting. It was like the, the Russian doll. And I was like, the colon is like, you just like, that's where you twist the, the, the top off. And there's another doll inside. Like, that's what it felt like the way that she was mm-hmm. using that punctuation to show like what each clause before was holding. And I was like, that's amazing. I want to try to do that. Um, I was reading Carl. Phillips, uh, who is so good at extending his sentences. Uh, he's so good at um, yeah. the subordinate clause uh, and the reversal. Um, and I don't know all the technical rhetorical terms for that, but I, I, I do know that there's a way that he extends time. Like we're in like a, a moment for like lines and lines and lines and lines. And it's so, um, it, I, I think I wanted to figure out how to do that too. Um, so I would say like in some ways reading the, uh, Carl Phillips and, and Bridget Kelly, like the, they really um, shaped my thinking about punctuation for this book. Um, and the other thing that happened, so uh, the, the section headings, which are like now, then, now, then, Um, And then there's one that's like now, and then it sort of fades to then. Um, That was really because uh, my editor wanted, he wanted sections and I was resistant to sections for a long time. And he was like, we need, basically he was like, in not so many words, we need some space. He was like, we need to breathe in this book. And I was like, okay, okay. Um, And so I added like blank pages. And he was like, what if we had something on the pages, like section numbers? And I was like, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) and he, and I was like, but I think I understand what the impulse is and the impulse makes sense to me. So let me see if there's something that makes more sense. And actually when I put the now then, like those headings in the, like that really opened up the, the book for me. I was like, oh, this feels like something whole now mm-hmm. um, in a way that it hadn't quite before when it was it was so compressed like adding that air and adding the structures between the sections really um, made the made the book cohere for me 
I love it. There's so much, yeah, that's going on with time and with motion and, and, and looking and looking again and then different kinds of looking, even if it seems to be the same person looking or possibly even the same intention behind looking. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate that liveliness in your poems, that sense of like animation or like, uh, there's something very like primordial in the sense of like, uh, like life can spring out. Like there's already mm-hmm. life there, but like more, is, you know how they talk about like the primordial time and this is the soup mm-hmm. of cre- the creation of life. And yep, when yep. the earth was teeming with possibility, it's like, <laughs> but that's actually the renunciations. And I think your poems in general, <laughs> <laughs> I will say that. I will write that down. It's like <laughs> the primordial soup. Um, I just like found that. that so exciting. I'm like, this is, you know what? This this science class is really hitting its stride. I really <laughs> like it. Um, maybe we can, uh, I just want to remind people who are here, if you want to ask a question in chat or the official like Q&A, um, you know, I, you know, would be nice to take a look at some of your thoughts. Um, but otherwise, I'll just keep going because I'm just asking what I'm personally curious about. We haven't had a chance to really sit and talk about your book since it's been published. Yeah. Um, um, so ask, um, are there any choices that you want to see as part of a broader poetics? I'm thinking about a Black oh. lesbian poetics and about, um, you said something in one space and I listened to some of your interviews as well, which you have a great voice great jokes oh. wonderful sense of timing oh, thank you. Uh, but <laughs> constructing um i think this is something that someone said about your work though constructing a space beyond naming possibly mm-hmm. this was in the kenyan review so um in those poetics um that i'm pretty sure that you're crafting but i want to ask you about it is um what are possibly some of the new ideas about standing where we are as opposed to this christopher columbus style Mm -hmm. of just naming then taking or standing on a plot of land or inside of an idea and Jamaica Kincaid has a lot of beautiful you know nonfiction writing about this Um, Mm -hmm. and so I just was curious about you know what it is that you're doing and what you would like to see um, emerge as a more you know empowered tradition. Uh, This is a great question I don't think I have a good answer to it um, because it I'll try in just a second, but I, I do think it, the question is one that um, requires a kind of thinking I'm not practiced in, which is like one that's like thinking about like poetics. Um, I sometimes can't like mm-hmm. quite get a grasp all the way on like what like that is, but I do like what you're saying about um, uh, a poetics that like moves past naming that isn't about dominion. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. like, and I think that's one of the things that's that I'm really pushing back against in the book is like the the idea of um, a kind of hierarchy between people and between peoples, um, but also a hierarchy of people over everything else on the planet. Mm hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and it's just like we're the and best like, and it's like, yeah are we, are we though? Are this is a mad medium um <laughs> like animal uh yeah I like stand near a horse I'm like that's definitely not yeah. I don't know about this yeah this this doesn't feel like dominion um and yet uh so I think like that's what I'm interested in developing is like moving more towards a model that's like predicated on kinship one that's more lateral instead of hierarchical mm-hmm. um I don't know what other people are interested in or what other folks ought to be doing, but I know for like my life, it, it feels like a lot of the movement in my life is, is towards that, is towards a kind of um, like we are connected not only to each other, but to everything else. <laughs> like nothing we do is without effect elsewhere. And so there's a way that, um, being cognizant of that I think might yield something more sustainable than what we're doing right now and I I don't think I even I I don't even mean that just for poetry I mean that just like in the world um it's like feeling connected and not feeling entitled to all of the resources not feeling entitled like not Mm -hmm. even like moving things to the category of resources 
<laughs> you know, it's yeah. like what, you know, and I, it, that to me feels like a practice that I'm engaged in, although it's slow. Cause that's like trying to turn, like, or turn around something that's really big and yeah. like really old, you know? Um, so, and I, I feel like marginally hopeful. <laughs> I don't know. It's made, it's made things feel better for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think the quality of my life is a lot softer, um, and a lot more sincere and I'm grateful for that. So. I love it. I definitely, it, you know, it makes me feel aspirational, not only just as a person, but as a reader, you know, some of these ideas and how you're rendering portraits of, of time, of memory, of landscapes, of um, moving between those things and transition. And so um, I think we have time for one more question. I don't see any in the chat so I'm just gonna ask you what I feel like asking you okay. and thank you again for this reading if you weren't out of time you know the poems are flawless your chain is flawless your shirt you. button to the top <laughs> haircut all I'm of it I'm just trying to be Perfect. like you Levin I'm just trying to get like you that's all <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept it I love that thank yeah. you for reflecting all that tenderness <laughs> Um, so I, I'm really interested in where you write or the speaker says or repeats, I remember. And I wonder um, can, if memory can limit myth um, and if you are or how you're measuring or questioning the positioning of gods. Um, and yeah, maybe you would frame this differently, but the way that you use these figures is super intriguing. And some of the criticism I've read, it, it, you know, I think is really looking at how we understand these figures and monsters originally. And it just really seems like you're engaging from a different space and declaring mm -hmm. different things. So, yeah, I mean, I, mm, okay. Carl Phillips, who has been very influential in my thinking, uh, he has this mm -hmm. essay that's like on the use of myth and fable or something like that. It's in the coin of the realm. Uh, I think that's like his first craft book. Okay. Um, he, uh, he writes, and maybe I'll get, I mean, I'm, it's possible I'm going to get this backwards, but I think he writes something along the lines of myths are what we use to explain what we don't understand. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we don't understand something, but we need a story to make it make sense. And so my mythology sort of comes in to do that work. Um, and so like thunder, right? It's like, oh, there's a God mm -hmm. of thunder. So mm -hmm. there's like, there's a dude who's up there like, yeah, or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, and I, there are things that I haven't understood about the dynamics in my family. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. Um, one of the ways that I, I think like myth is working alongside memory in these poems is that the myths are meant to, are like serve the function of elevating in some way, uh, the memory, but also sort of explaining the memory or explaining something about the dynamic, uh, within, uh, within the memory. So like there's a father and there's a daughter right? There's a mm -hmm. God and there's a mortal, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that for me was very much what it felt like as a child, like that adults could act with impunity and especially men could act with impunity. Absolutely. Um, that continues to be true. Uh, mm -hmm. I think more or less uh, inside my family and mm -hmm. it's bad vibes. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's part of what I'm like interested in. They're, like the myth sort of helped help me figure out the dynamic so that then I could say, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a part of this. This actually is not mm -hmm. how I want to engage. Um, and, and so I think maybe to answer your question, the, the myth helped reveal something about the memory or about the hold that the memory mm -hmm. had and also moved it into the place of narrative. And like a narrative can be rewritten, a narrative can be dismissed you know, it's, it makes it different than like something that's like embedded or um, total in its control, you know? Mm. Um, so I think that's what I was doing intuitively. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a more, it, 
it maybe requires more of you to engage um, myth in that way and to not treat it as this fixed thing and as like that you have to have some sort of courage or at least willingness to experiment to engage with it in that way um, especially because people think they just know you know we are just so familiar we know exactly what it means when you bring in this figure or this mm -hmm. creature and it's like you don't know you read a Danica Kelly poem and you'll really learn how little you just know um, and so yeah I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your work with us and thank you know all of you for being here with us if you don't have Danica Kelly's books you really need them there are links in the chat for their enunciations um, and for Exiles of Eden which you should also get as a bomb book um, <laughs> highly recommend they pair well thank together so they're beautiful together <laughs> thank you yes thank please you. buy the books um, thank you so much Danica thank you Lutton um, uh, the video of this reading will be on our website, wab.org. I want to thank our co-sponsor, Quayley. I want to thank our sponsors. There they are. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, say thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Levin. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dan.